everybody, Christine here. I'm a forensic genetic genealogist and I help the police and people identify persons of interest through genetic genealogy. And we are here with the Unknown Humans Remain True Crime podcast talking about unidentified humans. And this case we're going to talk about today uh, is from Alabama. Uh, and this gentleman was found on June 3rd, 1988. And let's get into the case. All right. So as some of you know, uh, or you may not know, this may be the first episode that you're listening to um, or watching that I go into the NAMIS database. That is a database um, compiled of uh, missing persons that have not been found. Uh, unidentified persons, meaning they found a deceased person's body, but they're unable to identify them. And then they also have unclaimed persons, which are people who have died and they know who they are, but unfortunately nobody has claimed the body, like maybe a relative or something like that. And this uh, series focuses on the unidentified human remains cases uh, this podcast changed the name up a little bit, Unknown Humans Remain, because part of what I do is to try to get dignity and get these poor folks laid to rest properly, right? Get their uh, information for their family, closure for their family, uh, raise awareness, and that's why we focus on this. So when I go into the database, I'm, I always try to think of what you know what what's in there what are these situations that uh cause these poor folks to be unidentified and in this case you know i've gone and done some of the babies some of the fetuses and in this case i said well let me see what are some of the oldest folks okay that are in here and in this case this one popped up in birmingham alabama and this man, unfortunately, was estimated to be 80 to 90 years of age. And I was like, oh my goodness, what happened? And I'll just tell you, my first thought is always as a former police officer, right? Um, and going through it in my own family, my first thought is always dementia. Did somebody wander away? My mom had dementia. So let's take a look at this case. Let's see what we can think about uh, what what we might know, uh, where we can go uh, besides the genetic genealogy that might get us some clues to this case. So the body was found June 3rd, 1988, again in Birmingham, Alabama, and they identify it as a black African-American male, okay? And we do have a medical examiner case number, um, Let's see, it says adult pre-90, which is what I searched in. I was kind of shocked um, that it says the estimated age range is 80 to 90. And that's just, it's just really sad. It's really sad at any age, but this is just kind of really sad, right? Um, you picture your grandparent wandered off or God knows what happened and uh, they don't come home. So it says the height is 5'6". And um, the NAMAS case, so the body was found in 1988, and the NAMAS case was created in October 2016. And this was in Birmingham, Alabama, in Jefferson County. Now, we know we that these, or we estimate these maps um, are not always right. We haven't had uh, very much success uh, with this map, this pinning location, uh, because more than likely it's a general area. But sometimes there's uh, clues within the narrative, within, within the little blurb or the writing uh, details, the short details that we have here that help us. So in this case, uh, we have a zip code, 35207, again, in Jefferson County, no GPS coordinates, and it says, um, the circumstances of recovery are scattered skeletal remains were discovered by surveyors in a wooded area behind the North Birmingham Golf Course, which is now the location of Carver High School. And when I started reading through this, sometimes I read through them, sometimes I don't, this was interesting to me because I went to Carver Middle School, 
uh, not Carver High School, not in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. But when I saw that name, that brought back memories. All right. So um, it looks like just from what we are reading here, uh, maybe they were building the school and um, North Birmingham Golf Course. Maybe that was a city golf course um, or a county golf course and they uh, shut it down and turned it into a high school. So we can take a look at that. But let's see what else is in the case. So one thing I focused on here was it said scattered. All right. Um, and it says not recognizable, near complete or complete skeleton. Unknown hair color, um, anything on that. We don't know anything on the body. But here, and this was interesting because it said scattered. Now, not to get gross or anything, but, you know, when they were building or they were raising it or whatever, how did it get scattered? Because you'll see here that we've got clothing and stuff on the body. So that's weird. So did something happen uh, in the construction and that's how it got scattered? Um, but again, as I mentioned, when I saw, I had read through it, when I saw scattered, that was kind of weird. So it says that uh, this gentleman had a key ring with three keys affixed. Gosh, wouldn't there be a way, um, you know, if we a chipped key or something like that, wouldn't that be a great way, um, not that we want to be tracked necessarily, but like a car key or something with a chip in it, that would be great if uh, maybe it was identified. Uh, what did the key ring, what did the key ring say? In hearing with the golf course or whatever, um, you know, could, could he have been, when I see, you know, a key ring, um, could he have worked at the at the golf course, who knows? What are those keys? A house key, a mail key, and something else? Um, clothing, blue and white, yellow striped, long sleeve sport shirt. Now, I'm not uh, too sure what a sport shirt would be. Uh, blue, white, yellow, long sleeve. Body was found in June. Uh, I don't know depending on what you're doing. If you want to be wearing a long sleeve sports shirt in June in Alabama, um, maybe could he have been golfing? Could he have been golfing? And, um, you know, they have uh, different courses back in the day. That's not too far back, but back in the day, uh, dress requirements that, you know, maybe you had to have your arms covered or maybe it was a little cooler. Um, who knows what, what can we, what can we infer? from the the sport shirt from the long sleeve sport shirt it says uh, also brown leather belt with metal belt buckle and green polyester type dress pants 34 inch waist and 31 and a half inch length so the the key ring with three keys affixed it says was near the body the long sleeve striped sport shirt was on the body and the brown leather belt uh, with metal belt buckle and the green polyester pants were near the body. Interesting. No eyewear, no footwear, and no jewelry. So, crazy, huh? So my first thought is um, nobody's missing. Nobody's missing this gentleman, right? And and this is the most intriguing thing to me. This gentleman whether he was, even if he was living on his own, let's just pause it, right? Like why, what is the disconnect, right? Not inferring anything negative, but what is the disconnect that we can solve here about people that go missing? Uh, was he living with a family and, you know, he just didn't come home? I mean, obviously he was self-sufficient we we assume because he had you know he had the keys and everything he could come and go somewhere he was responsible it looks like he was responsible enough um and so he was he living with a family and nobody reports him missing uh you know could it have been at a facility uh, or maybe he was even living on his own. Well, if he was living on his own, right, that this is the crazy part. If he was living on his own, 
was he renting an apartment? Um, there would be a landlord. Like eventually when the rent didn't get paid, somebody would say that, you know, uh, John Doe is missing. Or if he owned his home and the taxes didn't get paid and the grass became overgrown, it's just, it's just kind of mind boggling. All right, let's take a look. You know, what do you think about this? Um, I don't know how to fix this. Now, obviously we talk about having this NAMIS database is great, uh, but we can already see the disconnect between the fact that he went missing in 1988 and he only got put in here in 2016, right? So that's a, that's a lot of years trying to get all these cases into the database. Um, and hopefully on the back end, right? I know people do hand searches, um, but hopefully on the back end, there is a huge database that's uh, putting, you know, trying to match things together and pop out results. So let's see if we can find just where the Carver High School is. Okay, so here we are. I just did a quick Google search for Carver High School and um, we see it here. It looks to be, okay, so there's North Birmingham. Remember they talked about it used to be the North Birmingham golf course uh and and this is back in 1988 remember so it's not going to look exactly like it looks today and i see that big um looks like a green belt area kind of hard to see exactly where the high school is oh there it is that's the stadium or the track and field okay so those of you that are um, listening and not watching it looks to be right around the curve of highway or interstate 65 uh, between interstate 65 and uh, a local highway or is that uh, interstate highway 31 uh, Decatur highway yeah US highway 31 and US highway 65 wow that looks like a great um, a great area for the school they got a huge track that's identified um and i don't know if the highway system was in place in 1988 we do have um a fairly uh not too densely which is nice populated area of homes here um let's see just throwing out some of the streets for those of you that might be listening 37th avenue north 35th avenue north um and and yeah, so that was the it, it it looks like a great area, probably because they had that whole uh area for the golf course. And then we've got uh just at the northeast Ruth's Cafe on 24th Street North. So yeah, it looks like there is a housing area here. Uh, you know, who knows? Hopefully he didn't wander uh, off you know, out of a car from the highway, uh, where did the highway go and what did it even look like back in 1988? And then across from the high school, across the highway, we've got the Flying J Travel Center. Uh, that probably, who knows, wasn't there uh, back in the day. Yeah, so what can we, what can we do with this? It looks like, um, I'm just moving down a little bit into Birmingham. So the North Birmingham, I'm seeing as I move south um, into Birmingham proper, it looks like it. Uh, we're north of the convent. It says a convention complex, uh, the Evergreen neighborhood. Um, and yeah, uh, on the, let's see, over on the west side of the area, it says American Cast Iron Pipe Company. It looks like some I don't know if they're dredging, digging, or manufacturing, whatever they're doing over there, but that's a pretty big industrial area. But we've got a pretty good housing uh, area here that um, I don't know what happened to this poor gentleman. Where did he come from? Why, what, yeah, what happened? So again, trying to raise awareness for these people. Uh, again, really sad that this gentleman between 80 or 90 years of age and, um, you know, looked like he was living his life. However, whatever, what, what happened to him? And the goal is to get these people recognized, get them identified, whether through normal means or genetic genealogy and uh, give some answers for their family. And, and most importantly, put them to rest properly.
right, with dignity. Uh, these stories are just heartbreaking. Well, uh, let me know. Please comment below or in any of the videos. Do you find this helpful? Do you find it interesting? Do you think that I should continue? We've had almost a year of these episodes and always want to know if you think that it's making a difference or what would you like to see differently. If you do support what I do, uh, I'm trying to raise awareness and get more likes uh, for the channel, get subscriptions so that it can get monetized and help us raise money for these folks and for this initiative so we can solve more donating time and uh, funds to the police departments to get these people identified. All right, thank you. Uh, once again, uh, there's way more cases and lots more to do. But thank you for your time and thank you for paying attention. And I'll talk to you soon.